Come in the name of Jesus. All the unspoken requests tonight. God, minister, Lord, in the name of Jesus, God. Oh, touch your people tonight. Lift us up, God, tonight, Lord. God, let your church, Lord, be lifted up tonight, God. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, Lord. Your will be done in this house. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen, amen. Let's get in and worship me for just a few minutes tonight. Amen. Been a rough week for some. Amen. But God's given us the opportunity to come into this house. Lay aside everything tonight and just stay in His presence for a few minutes.
And I'm gonna sing till my heart starts changing. Oh, I'm gonna worship till I mean every word. Cause the way that I feel and the fear I'm facing doesn't change who you
me and Brother Kyle was talking earlier. Life happens every day. You know, we had a great move Sunday. Great move of God Sunday. It's been three days between Sunday and today. Life changed Monday. Tuesday was a different day. I've been doing some studying and come to find out he's been doing studying in the same thing. Y'all heard me preach from it time and time again from Romans chapter 7. That's one of the most critical chapters in all of Scripture. Because there's so many people today that when we have days like Sunday and it's so great that they get on this cloud nine feeling and everything is just wonderful and they're feel like they're spiritually just overflowing. And then the next day when life happens, it just wipes out everything. But that's not the way that God intends for it to be. Just because circumstances arise does not change who you are. More than importantly, it doesn't change who God is. Romans chapter 7 is full of a man named Paul that wrote two-thirds of the New Testament and he's talking about everyday life and how hard he struggles. Anybody else in here besides me struggle? Men? Like Sister Hannah, you can look across our faces. I'll say, man, there's, probably, there's been some struggles this week. There's been some struggles this week. When I told somebody the other day, you know what that means? If it makes you feel any better, if you struggle this week, that means you're on the same level as the man that wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Because he said, every time I want to do good, every time I get to a place like Sunday when everything is going great, every time I want to do good and I start to do good, I turn around and evil is present with me. And then he makes the statement, that that I would do, that that my spiritual man would do, my fleshly man will not. And the things that my spiritual man would not do, that's the things that the fleshly man wants to do. And he goes into the next verse and he said, For I find that within my members, in my body, my mind, my soul, my heart, my physical body, my spiritual, he said, I find in all of those things, I find that there is a war going on. And I just want to say this tonight and we'll go on into our, our if you struggle this week and if you may not feel the same way you felt when you left here Sunday ladies if you come back from a high from the youth conference and you don't really feel that same high today don't let the change in circumstances drop you from that high just understand that it's just another day in the life of a child of God. I'll overcome it. I'll walk through it. And the next day, I'll walk out of it onto the other side. And I'll just keep moving forward. Amen. Amen. You just got to keep walking. Amen. You just, you just, brother, brother Ross, you just got to keep walking. And understand that, hey. If I'm struggling, I, I, I'm just like that person. Look, look that person in front of you and behind you. Look over there, Brother Ross. If you struggle this week, you're just like him. And if you struggle this week, you're just like me. Amen. But you know what God did? God gave us something inside of us. An unchangeable spirit and a, an unflappable a, 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 a will that he puts and just push right on through. Just keep pushing. Just keep it gives us joy. Amen. When it's good, he's worthy of your song. When it's bad, he's worthy of your song. But I'm going to throw this at you too. And, and, and I hope you'll clap for me when I say this. The difference is that when it's good and when it's bad, your song shouldn't change. He's God when it's good. He's God when it's bad. 
He's God when I'm on the mountain. He's God when I'm in the valley. I'll praise him when I'm high. I'll praise him when I'm low. I'll praise him when I got money. I'll praise him when I don't. I'll praise him when I'm happy. I'll praise him when I'm sad. I'll praise him when I'm spiritual. I'll praise him when I'm struggling. My song don't change. I walk through the valley. Yeah, no, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Thou art with me. Thy rod and the high prayer I preach about. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And then he goes on and said, surely goodness and mercy, the devil may seem like he's on your trail tonight. But let me remind you that David said, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. He can't get close to you, but this goodness and mercy is following you all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Nothing will change me. Nothing will deter me. Nothing will pull me aside. I'll serve him. I'll worship him. I'll praise him in the storm. I'll praise him in the sunshine. It won't change my song. <laughs> it won't change my song. Amen. He's worthy. He's worthy. Amen. Brother Aaron sent me a song yesterday and it just simply said God is a good God. <laughs> and for about 15 minutes that man sang that God is a good God. And then he dove off a little bit deeper and he come back and said God is a good God. And I thought about how good it was and then to see the things that I saw Sunday, and, and, and but my mind went back a little bit further, and I just thought about how good God's been. Amen. I could start right here, and you wouldn't have to testify. I've been here for about a year now, a little over a year, and I could probably go down the road and remind you of, of some things that I saw. God do for you yes. in this last year. And you could probably say the same thing for me. I, I, I've saw God be good to you this year, oh boy. Brother Rich, he's a good God. Yes, amen. amen, he's faithful. He's faithful. Yes, amen, don't let circumstances change your song. Right. Continue to worship. Right. Continue to pray. Not only in here, praise him on the job. Praise Him at home. When you're standing washing dishes, praise Him. Amen. When you're pulling clothes out of the dryer, praise Him. Amen. When you're making coffee, praise Him. Amen. When you're welding, praise Him. Amen. When you're driving at 2 in the morning, praise Him. Amen. Praise Him. Praise Him. Had a man asked me this week, and I'm going to turn these glasses loose and jump because to go to their back. I Drove up, was unloaded. This young man walked up to me, began to talk to me. He said, is that your truck? I said, yes, my truck. He said, is that your trailer? I said, yes, it's my trailer. He stood there a few minutes and we just began to talk. All of a sudden it hit me. Just like that, Brother Richard. A ton of bricks had hit me. Man. Sometimes I get up in the morning and I go to work. And it never even phases me. Just how good God's been to me, even with the job that I have. It's hard. I mean, it's going to be a hard day. I feel like I've got a long night. i got a long day. And that young man looked at me and, and, and he was just like, he was just... He said, one of these days, one of these days, I'm going to quit driving theirs. I'm going to have one of my own. And I said all that to say this. Sometimes the smallest things I miss, man, even in the little things, let God reveal himself to you. He's good. He's good. I look around here tonight at a beautiful bunch of healthy kids. He's good. Amen. A bunch of teenagers, and he's good. 
Amen. Amen. He's good. We got word this week, Sister Brandy made the prayer request down the kitchen that I grew up with. Has a 29 year old daughter that has Down syndrome and has some different things that goes along with that. She's been having some problems and found some knots under her arm. And they carried her to the, to the doctor and done a surgical procedure and done a biopsy. And a mother that that's the only thing she has is that baby found out this week that her baby has cancer. And that family that lost their daughter this week said a while ago, I cannot imagine. Church, I got a lot to be, to be thankful for. Got a lot to praise him for. Amen, Brother Richie's good. He's good. Don't let circumstances change your song. And if, you're, if your song starts to change, just turn around and look at your neighbor. Because when you think you got it bad, there's always somebody that's in a lot worse situation than we are. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. We're going to turn these young people loose to go to their classes tonight. Amen. Pray for Sister Lindsay, but Ross is here. Amen. To do theirs. Amen. One prayer request I did forget, Brother Aaron and Sister Kayla. Amen. Sadie has been sick all week, and she got better. And now uh, Sister Kayla is sick. Pray for that family as well tonight. Amen. Praise team done a fantastic job as always. Yeah, you can have a little bit of Okay, no. I just didn't know who had it. Well, you know. Don't leave us, many, but Rich. Amen. I'm not going to hold you there very long tonight. I want to finish up the thought that I had started a few weeks ago about the five different things, everyday life. Next, the next couple of weeks I'm still Bible school, going to do some different things. I told Wendy earlier, after Bible school, we're going to try to turn Wednesday nights around a little bit. We're going to try to make it interactive. Try to get more people involved and, and, and wanting to come, maybe to do some more things. So we're going to start a Bible study, but we're going to do a little bit different. We're going to split you up. We'll have a team on one side, a team on the other side, and after Bible study, we're going to ask some questions, some different things. You're going to have some different things you get points for. And at the end of the Bible study, whichever team loses, amen, they're going to have to feed the other team. Amen. Whatever that other team desires. So we've done this at, years ago at Richston, and we've done it in another place. It got to be very interesting. There was a man that was at Richston, and we included Bible scriptures. And man, I give a, a point every week for every chapter that you read. There was a man out of the church. If I called his name, most of you would know him. He came the, the first week, and he read like 10 or 20. The second week, he read 30. And after about a month, he was reading 100 to 200 to 300 chapters a week. And to this day, when that man sees me, he'll say, I'm still reading. And his wife said that simple little thing that encouraged him to read, it got in. And the word became a part of him. And today, he'll get up and just sit in his chair and just read chapter after chapter after chapter. So we're going to try to make it a little bit interactive. Amen. First Timothy chapter 6. If you got it. 
1 Timothy chapter 6. We talked a few weeks ago about some, the five different things that we, uh, that of everyday life, of time and treasure and talents and your temple, your tree, your family, your friends, relationships. Your temple is, is your physical, mental, spiritual body and the talents that you have and the things that God has given you. I want to try to hit those. We kind of hit the last two of the first night. So I want to talk to you for just a few minutes tonight, not very long at all. Try to let you go. Amen. Talking about uh, the different things in Scripture. First Timothy chapter 6. Talk for just a few minutes about, uh, about money, about finance, about what the Bible says about our uh, everyday life and the finance that we have. Amen. The scripture is very, very plain. That it doesn't matter how much money you have or how much money you don't have. Amen. That that's not where our trust should be anyway. Amen. No matter what situation in life that we find ourselves in, we must trust God for everything. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17. He said, charge them that are rich in this world. And when you find that word rich, you may say, I'm not rich. And look, we look in this room tonight and, and we are rich. You, don't, you may not have a million dollars in the bank, but did, it, was there any of us that didn't have anything to eat today? Got in a nice vehicle and come to church. When it was hot, we turned on the air conditioning. When it's cold, we turn on the heat. We want to go to Walmart, we go to Walmart. We want to go to Popeye's, we... God's blessed us. Right. Amen. We, you may not consider yourself to be rich like people in the world. You may not be Bill Gates rich, but you've been blessed. Amen. Charge them which are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in certain riches, but in the living God... Who giveth us riches, uh, who giveth us, uh, us richly all things to enjoy. Amen. They that do good, they that do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. O Timothy, keep thou that which is committed to thy trust. Avoid profane and vain babbling and oppositions of, of science falsely so-called. I mean, he's telling us in these scriptures about the riches of this world, not to trust in them. And the reasons that we have, amen, that God gives to us. God gives us, and I believe God wants us to have a happy life. I believe God wants us to have a good life. He wants us to be able to be uh, uh, to be happy and to enjoy everything. It, the, the Bible says this, several things about money that I want to give you very quickly. Everything that we have and everything that we did have or we ever would have belonged to God and it was a gift from God. Psalms 24 and 1 said, The earth and everything in the world and its inhabitants belong to the Lord. Doesn't matter who you are, where you have come from, what you have earned, or what you have. It is because you were blessed of the Lord. Everything that we have was given to us from God. God gave us these things, and he has challenged us to be stewards of, of what he gives to us. Luke chapter 12 talks about the parable of the talents. And he gave to some uh, 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 this number. He some, some, uh, gave some uh, uh, one five and one two and one one. And he came back uh, I mean, at another time. And, and the one that he had given five to, he doubled those talents. And the one he gave him two, he doubled his. And the one that had one, he buried it in the earth because he was afraid of the master. God has challenged us and he has given us all these things in life to be stewards over what we have. The, last, the, the third thing that I want you to see is in some ways money reveals the hearts of a lot of people. Amen. For where your treasure is, 
there your heart will be also. Matthew 6 and 21. The only way to spend, uh, the way we spend our money in a lot of places demonstrates uh, in where we have our trust. Amen. If we use things wisely, if we are good stewards of, of what God has given to us, then we will be happy in the way that we do. Amen. There's another principle that the Bible uh, uh, lays out very plainly. Money will not make you happy. Amen. Some people say money can't buy happiness, but country songs said, but they can buy a boat. Amen. They can buy ice cream. It can buy a lot of things that will that, that will make you happy for a season. But it will not satisfy the longing in your life. At, at the end of your life, it does not matter how much money that you have. At the end of your life, you're not going to stand before God and say, here's a check for this amount. Can I get in? When we stand before God, the richest man in the world and the bum with nothing are going to stand on the same ground and answer to the same God the same way. Amen. It reveals our hearts, though, a lot of times, what we do. Amen. Uh, 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 it, it, it brings us to a place, amen, that we uh, uh, understand that he had. God, and this is a principle that I wanted to throw in because this is what a lot of people struggle with. There's a lot of people in the world today that have a lot. And there's some that don't have much. And there's a lot of people in the church world that look at their neighbor who's prospering and they're struggling and they wonder why. You ever heard anybody like that? You ever made that? I made that statement. Amen. Men and women looked at one another and said, we do every, try to do everything we can and, and, and serve you and, and preach and sing and do. And it seems like that we just struggle. Every time ends are going to meet, well, why somebody moves in? You ever, you ever felt like that? And then you look at your neighbor that's not trying to live right and they got a huge house and four or five cars and boats and four, and everything is... It seems to be going their way and they don't seem to struggle and that a lot of Christian people get hung up on that. I mean, everybody's not given the same amount. I don't understand. Scripture doesn't say why God does some of the things that he does. Why it is that way. It is important for us to understand that God has not gifted everyone equal. In his grace, he has conceded some people with greater skills or talents uh, and different things. Some people were blessed with uh, uh, with more material things than others. Amen? But my daddy always had this kind of statement. He said, I believe God gave me just what he could trust me with. We never had a lot, but we never done without. We never had the biggest house on the hill. We lived in a little mobile home most of my life. Four of us and mom and daddy were raised in a 12 by 60 mobile home that mom and daddy lived in until the tornado took it out from under. That's what we were raised. But we never, we always had what we needed. Daddy didn't, didn't, uh, uh, didn't have the best ed education in the world. His daddy left home when he was in, in the eighth grade. My dad quit school in the eighth grade and took a full-time job to support six brothers and sisters. He didn't have an education. We didn't have what a lot of people did, but we always had enough. And then because he didn't trust in, his, in the money, he trusted in the God that he served. We must be careful in everything that we do with our money. We must be careful how we spend it. We must be careful to give back to God what is His. And I'm not going to stand up here and preach and, and, and go into tithes very, uh, a whole lot tonight. But the Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. I mean, if we give of that, then God will bless us for that. Now, I want to go into the second part of this. Uh, I want you to get in and help me for just a minute. Go to Romans 11 and 29, Sister Hannah. Romans 11 and 29. 
We're going to get to the third part of that little thing that we talked about. Let's talk for a few minutes on, on talents and gifts. There's a difference between somebody, I think Sister Brandy put that on there. So I think today Ricky and I were standing out there waiting on a load and I pulled up my Facebook page and Kevin Wallace was on there and he was talking about the difference between gifts and talents. Did anybody see that? And he talks about that a talent, there's people that in all phases of life that are talented. Mm -hmm. Christians and, and non-Christians. There's some of the most ungodly people in the world. There are some of the most talented people in the world. There's a difference between a talent and a gift. And he made this statement. You can't receive a gift from God until you are saved and become a spiritual creature. Because God's gifts are spiritual. Romans 11, 29 says this. We've all heard this. For the gifts and the call of God are without repentance. The gifts and the call. I want to get into the difference of that for just a minute. A gift, the scripture, that word that, that you read there in that verse means a gratuity that has been delivered or, or something that has been given as a token. But it also means a spiritual endowment. A gift that God has given to you is a spiritual endowment that God has placed in your life. What is an endowment? It's something that was given, right? When you, uh, uh, when you, when, when somebody gives you an endowment or an, an inheritance, they are giving you something that they want you to keep, something that becomes a part of you. A gift from God that he's talking about in this scripture is a spiritual endowment. It is a spiritual gift that is given to you that people that have talents will not have. They may can make the same kind, and, 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 and this is where the difference really comes in. A spiritual gift differs from a talent by the, by the purpose of the gift and by the reaction of the ones that are in the presence of the gift. A person can stand up and have the same talent to play that piano and sing the same songs that we just heard. And if they do not have a spiritual gift, their talent might sound really good. But there won't be any spiritual effects from their talent. Because a spiritual gift is something that is spiritually endowed. It is a, and I love this part of this definition, it is a miraculous, a miraculous faculty. It is an inherited mental and physical power that is given from God. It is that place that when we begin to sing or preach or play or minister or witness and that that the anointing comes into your life. It opens up a total different part of your abilities that normal talented people don't have. The anointing brings you to a place that rises above normal talent and a spiritual endowment takes over. What happened around here Sunday? What happened around here tonight? A spiritual endowment took the talent that these folks have and takes it to another level. And because it is a spiritual endowment, spiritual things begin to happen. When spiritual people use their gifts, the spirit begins to operate. In every service, you may not see it, but when singing and preaching is taking place, it's not just what you see up here. I heard somebody say not long ago, that's one of the biggest problems in the church today is everybody has their focus on the state. And we fail to see what God is doing in the pews. Because when singing and worship is happening up here, the Spirit of God is moving out there. There's the difference between talent and guilt. 
mentality used by a spiritual creature or a spiritual person, the spiritual things begin to move in the room where that they are. Things begin to happen. Preachers begin to preach above what they know. People, teachers begin to teach above their normal understanding. Ricky was standing there today and, 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 and David Wallace was on there and, and I was letting him listen to that. He just stood there and he was just blown away. My dad was sitting at the house last week, I think it was, and me and Bo were sitting there talking to him. And uh, he began to talk about church and worship and different things. And, and, and we began to listen to some singing and began to listen to some preaching. And, and right there in the living room, the word began to go forth. And, and, and the preacher began to get excited. And, and you could feel the Spirit of the Lord begin to move around in that room. My daddy was sitting over there, and the next thing you know, tears was flowing down his face. And he was he just threw his right there, he just threw his hands up and began to worship in the middle of that room. When spiritual people begin to use spiritual gifts, spiritual things begin to take place. That's what we need in the church today. We need more spiritual gifts to operate. We need people to get to a place where there is a miraculous thing that happens in their life. The only reason that I am here tonight is because something miraculous happened. My wife will tell you, you've heard me tell this before. Growing, I could not carry on a conversation with anybody. You may find that hard to believe now. I, if I saw you in Walmart and I knew you, and if I thought you may want to talk to me, I would go all the way around the store just so I wouldn't have to talk to you. I was that bad. I had a stuttering problem. I couldn't talk. And when I did begin to talk, my anxiety would raise up and I would just about freak out. Look at me now. My wife said I could talk to anybody, anywhere, for any amount of time. Something happened in me. Something changed. A miraculous thing happened in my mind, in my heart. God healed a stuff. Now, I still have some at times like it, it, it just don't all come out like it should. But I'm not the only one that had that problem. Brother Rich, God healed that part of my mind. God healed that part of my person. Do you know there are parts of a, of a person's personality that God has to heal before they can be really used? Mm -hmm. yeah. Sometimes God has to get that shyness out. Sometimes God has to get that fear out. My wife, for a long time, she had stage fright. When we would get ready to sing in those places, she would would just be scared to death. God healed that from her. She still got gets nervous at times. You shake your head, no, but we've, we've done a lot of singing in a lot of places. We've sang to 10, we've sang to five, we've sang to 300. Those days, stage fright really takes over. But there are places that God has to heal. In my mind, in my heart, God, healed that in me. God changed that. He gave me a spiritual endowment that opened up the faculties of my mind that I would have never had above that anointing. That's what he gives. Anybody want to say anything? I don't want to just stop here all night. Anything you want to say? It is an inherent and I looked that word inherit up. I thought I knew what it meant. But scripturally, that word inherit means a permanent or a characteristic of a person. So you put all that together and then we'll move to the next part. It means that when God gives you a spiritual gift, 
and you begin to operate in that spiritual gift, he gives you a permanent character change. The characteristics of who you used to be changes. Who, what you used to do changes. The way you used to talk changes. The way you used to sing, you may have the same talent, but you don't deliver it the same way. Because when you begin to sing or you begin to teach or you begin to preach or you begin to witness, there is something that takes over that brings you to a place that God is using words through you and it's accomplishing spiritual things in your life. It is an inheritance or a permanent. God does not intend to give you a gift and you ever quit using that gift. You can. I know a lot of people that have. Years ago at the little church downtown, we had a revival. And they were two young men that preached in that revival. And if I called their name, a lot of you would know them. They preached in that revival. And today, neither one of them are even attending church. I went to a revival at Cornerstone Full Gospel Church when I was about 30 years old. And I heard a young man from Alabama preach like nobody I had ever sat under. I've heard some great preachers. This young man was about 30 or 32 years old. And I had never heard anybody preach and never felt the anointing like anybody else ever had. That young man came home from work one day and found his wife with another man. And to this day, he has never preached another sermon. I said all that to say this, circumstances change. Life throws curveballs a lot of times. And in, his, in, in that situation, I don't know where I may be today. But that does not change the gift. Let's go on to the next part. There's a thing called a calling. The gifts and the call of God. A calling is simply this. It is an invitation. It's an invitation to enter into a vocation. And I know what a vocation is. A vocation is an occupation. I'm a truck driver. I, by, by what I make my living as, I drive a truck. Brother Bryce works offshore. Brother Philip drives a truck. Sister Hannah works at the school. That is our occupation. That's how we make our living. But is that really the vocation that we need to be known for? The vocation that I have been called into is ministry, is, is a pastor. You have been called, she's been called into music ministry. This young man here has the ability to play drums like I wish I could. There are people in this room and people in this church that are not here tonight that I wish they were. Because we are filled with people that have talents. We have a church filled with people that have been given gifts. But now God is inviting us to take those gifts and those abilities and enter into a vocation, to an occupation. Amen. I ain't never had service before. It's a reminder. You have no health appointment. Ain't mine. We've been given an invitation. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 4. I'm saved. I'm going to get this and we'll, we'll close. Ephesians chapter 4. And we'll show you the difference between something that a lot of people also struggle with. And this is something that I have struggled with. To be just as honest as I could be tonight, if I would have had a choice, when God called me into this ministry, I would have turned and said, no, thank you. I was raised a pastor's kid. My dad was a pastor the day I was born. 
And I saw so many days and so many times I saw the hurt and the agony and the situations that our family was put in. And I saw my daddy more times than I want to count. Walk out of a church with knives all in his back from people that said they loved him, from family that said they loved him, and really they didn't. Because the first time that something happened that they didn't agree with, everything changed. If that happens in this church or any other church, then there are issues. We are not spiritual as we should be. If a church and a pastor cannot work out situations, we sat in our council room this Sunday. Everybody didn't think the same. You never do. But that doesn't mean that we turn on one another. <laughs> I saw that my whole life. And I'm like, not me. And when God called me to preach, God didn't call me to pastor. Not at first. And I thought, I can handle this part. I love the evangelism, and you know what? I still do. I love evangelism. We went, sang, preached, revival. You go in, you blow people in their back, you preach three or four days, you preach your guts out, and you leave. And there's some pastor behind the pulpit, he's dealing with what you preach while you were there for the next six months. And I'm like, no. So God called me to preach, and boy, we were just having it. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, all that stopped. All that changed. There was no more cause for revivals. There was no more cause for singings. There was nobody that called to come even for, for six months. I sat on the pew and didn't do one thing. My guy and Brother CJ always used us guys. But in that time, for some reason, and it was God working out, I, Brother Bryce, I preached one time in six months. And I got so miserable. I was about to explode. I had never went that long without preaching or singing. And I went to him and I said, what in the world has happened? And he said, you know. I said, I know what? He said, you tell me. And I looked at him and I began to cry and I said, but I don't want that. I said, my daddy was that. He said, well, guess what? You just got invited to the club that your daddy was in. And that's the word that he used. You have been invited. A calling is an invitation to accept a vocation. God gave me a vocation. Amen. Since 2006, I've been in this vocation. It's not always been easy. A lot of times it's been hard. And I've carried those same knives that my daddy carried. But I can tell you that after all these years, through 2006, in, in the good times and the hard times, God's still faithful. He says in, Paul says in Ephesians 4 and 1, he said, I therefore... Somebody read that word. A prisoner. The prisoner of the Lord. Have you ever thought about it that way? Paul said, I, the prisoner of the Lord. You know what a prisoner is? And it is just in the scripture, it's the same thing as you're thinking it now. When you are a prisoner, did you have a chance to leave? You don't. You don't. Paul said, I'm a prisoner of the Lord. So, and this is, and I made this statement, it's not fair. I told a man that one time, I didn't ask for this, it's not fair. And he looked at me and he said, you're going to learn in life that there ain't but one thing that a fair is good for. A fair is where you get content. A fair is where you ride the Ferris wheel. He said, but God is not about being fair. And then he went on to explain to me what fairness really was. 
He said, God put stuff inside of you that he didn't put in anybody else. He goes on to say in this passage of scripture, and I won't read all of them, but go down with me to verse number 11. It said, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers. He gives different things, different areas, and, and we won't get all this. We may come back next week and finish some of this. He gave different people for different things in the church. He gave all of these things. And to every one of these things, there are certain characteristics that you must have. A pastor has a different heart than an evangelist. A Sunday school teacher has a different heart than a pastor. A worship leader has a different mindset than a lot of others. There are different characteristics of different people. But he began to explain to me how that it was really fair. Because when God looked at me and knew that one day I would become this pastor, he said, God gave you everything the day you were born that you would need to fulfill this mission that he gave to you. He said the only way that it would not be fair was if God called you to do something that he did not equip you to do. But he never did, and he never has, and he never will. He said, a prisoner of, of, of Jesus, but going back to verse 2, or verse 1, he said, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you were called. The vocation wherewith you are called. You will go through the rest of this chapter and he is talking about vocation and calling and how it works and the one body and the one spirit and the one Lord, the one faith, one baptism and, and, and he builds up the work of the Lord and he builds up the calling and the vocation that God has all the way through verse number 11 and then he gives the reason for every one of these offices for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Why do you need a preacher? Because the body of Christ needs it. Why do you need worship leaders? Because the body of Christ needs it. Why do you need teachers? Because the body of Christ has to be built. Why do we need all these offices in the body of Christ? Because there are different offices and different jobs, but it takes everything coming together to make it all happen. We are all here for the body of Christ. We are all here for the edifying of the church. It goes on through the rest of that chapter. He talks about a lot of different things. We may come back next week and finish and get through this. You in this room, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, ten of us. Ten of us in this room. That means in this room, we have 10 callings. We have 10 callings. Yours is not mine. Mine is not yours. But you have them. If you are a child of God, if you are a Christian, and if you are a part of the body of Christ, you have been invited to step into a vocation. You have been invited to step into a office, if you will. If you, you've been invited to step into a work that God has invited and asked us to do. I will say again, whatever God deals with you, it may not be fair. It may not be what you would like. It may not be easy. You know, we come in and we look at a lot of times and a lot of services are easier than others. I would dare say tonight was not as easy as Sunday. Right? Not at all. I mean, but in all of those times, in the different situations, we must still be faithful. Right. We must still fulfill our charge and fulfill our vocation. Because of the spiritual nature 
what we've been given to do. You may not think a whole lot about these services, but I will promise you that in every service, in every situation, if the anointing comes, it will accomplish something. We leave a lot of times and we think, well, that was just a mundane little church. You don't know that. I don't know that. I don't know what God done. I don't know what God spoke. I don't know what God may be doing back there. They don't know what God may be doing out here. Whatever your call, whatever your vocation, do it. Do it with all your heart. Father, we thank you tonight. Thank you, Lord, for these that have gathered together. Lord, minister God to your people tonight, Lord, all these tonight that are sick and hurting God in different places, Lord. So many, God, that would love to be here tonight. Others, God, that would if they could. God, I pray you would just minister to them. Heal the sick. God, raise up those that are down today in the name of Jesus. Touch those tonight, God, that, uh, uh, Lord, that are looking around, that are searching and hungry. God, minister to them in a special way. God, let us be faithful in all we do. Let us be, God, at a place, God, that we uh, could be found pleasing to your sight. Let us walk in our vocation. Let us walk in the things that you have called us to do. Let us be all that you would have us to be in the name of Jesus. Let us faithfully fulfill our charge until we stand before you and hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant, in the name of Jesus. Bless every home and every family represented as we go our separate ways tonight. Keep us in your love in the name of Jesus. Amen.